another session by Al Islah. We have the pleasure of having Dr. Sayed Ali Hor Kamanpuri with us today, who is going who is going to be doing an, a presentation of uh, the overthrow of Islam by Ghulat, crystallization of the sectarian Shia identity during the Safavid period. Inshallah, once Sayed is done, we will open the floor up to the question and answers. Thank you, and welcome, Sayed. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد جزاك الله brother مدثر for the kind introduction I want to welcome all of you to this special lecture which is being organized by Al Islah on the overthrow of Islam by the Ghulat. And by the overthrow of Islam, we mean within their uh, movement. <clears throat> Islam is very much alive. And Alhamdulillah, it is uh, alive in theory, in the books, and also in practice. But the Ghulat, <clears throat> in their faith tradition, um, when we study their history <clears throat> to this very day, we find that they succeeded in replacing Islam with a new a religion or cult of their own uh, design, uh, which was to their liking and uh, based on their fabrications. And so this is what we're talking about because Ghulu today has become much more common and much more popular than it ever was. And uh, all of these movements towards Ghulu can be traced back to the Safawi period. So that's when the sectarian Shia identity, which is influenced by Ghulu gets crystallized. So <clears throat> once again, tonight we have an opportunity to delve a little bit deep into this. Uh, I'm once again covering for our learned Sheikh uh, Ali Karmali. We're still earnestly praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant complete shifa to his beloved father. Uh, he is very much uh, in our prayers and uh, we renew our prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him shifa and to restore him to full health <clears throat> so that the learned Sheikh can resume his uh, eye-opening and enlightening uh, lectures, inshallah. Uh, so for tonight, uh, let us proceed. First of all, when we talk about the overthrow <clears throat> of Islam within the Ghulu tradition, uh, I want to cite some passages uh, which serve as evidence of that overthrow. So here is a statement by Atullah Sheikh Abdullah Al Mamqani, with whose statement we had uh, begun the Ghulu series. And again, you see in the statement, I had previously referred to this. This is from, again, volume one of his 39 encyclopedia on Al Murrijal, entitled Tanqih al Maqal. Uh, it's page 334 of that encyclopedia. And here you see him. Uh, re reiterating and asserting what he has been repeating throughout this encyclopedia. He's a traditional scholar, remember, not a reformist. And he's saying, قَدْ نَبَّهْنَا غَيْرَ مَرَّةٍ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ رَمْيَ الْقُدَمَاءِ سِيَّمَ الْقُمِّيِّينَ مِنْهُمْ أَرَّجُلَ بِالْغُلُوِّ لَا يُعْتَنَا بِهِ He is admitting the fact that Islam, and not just Islam, but classical Shi'ism itself, has been completely overthrown. And he supports this overthrow. That's why he's saying, قَدْ نَبَّهْنَا غَيْرَ مَرَّةٍ He's saying we have drawn attention more than once that the classical scholars, especially the ones from Qum, he's talking about the 4th century, 3rd century, 2nd century Hijri scholars of Qum. He says when you see them accusing a man or a hadith narrator of Gulu, don't give it any consideration. Say, yeah, Sheikh Mamkani, you're such a great scholar of Rijal. You're telling us that we should not take the word of the classical Rijalists, the classical Shia scholars like Sheikh al Saduq, like Sheikh al Mufid, like Sheikh al Tusi, like a Sheikh al Najashi, like a Sheikh ibn al Ghadairi. These are all the classical Shia scholars of Al Rijal on whom today's uh, grand uh, maraja, like Ayatollah Sayyid the Sistani, in the past, Ayatollah Sayyid al khui Ayatollah Sayyid al-Shayn Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, all the grand maraj, their researches in Rijal are based on the researches of these classical scholars. 
But Ayatollah al-Mamqani in the modern period, he's telling us, no, no, no. When they accuse a hadith narrator or a person of ghulu, don't give it any consideration. So what's your hujja? What's, why, why are you saying this? Ya Ayatollah al-Mamqani. He says, because believing in what today constitutes the fundamentals of the Shia madhab these days was considered to be ghulu by the classical scholars. So if you accept the statements of the classical Shia scholars, then all the Shias today become ghulat. You, can't, you can no longer call yourself a Shia if you go by the definitions of the classical Shia scholars. Because what they defined as blasphemy, today your scholars and you yourself are believing it as an article of Shia faith. You're thinking it is an authentic belief of Shias. And then he starts giving examples. He says, don't you see that they deem denial of the fact that the Prophet and Imams can forget as ghulu, while today the situation has been reversed, such that anyone who does not deny that they may forget would be considered, uh, would not be considered a mu'min or a believer. And then he goes on to quote <laughs> the statement of Al-Fadil Al-Ha'iri. Okay, here he says, وَلَقَدْ أَجَادَ الْفَاضِلُ الْحَائِرِيُّ حَيْثُ قَالْ this is the interesting statement, which is very true. It is ironic. It is, you know, some people will find it uh, uh, funny, but it is true. He, this is Al-Fadil Al-Ha'iri, whom Ayatollah Mamkani is quoting. These are all traditional Shia scholars huh, who believe in today's Shiaism. Al-Fadil Al-Ha'iri, Ayatollah Mamkani says, he puts it rather beautifully when he says that the act of the Qummi scholars of the past accusing Hadith narrators of being Ghali and they're expelling them from the city of Qum because there was a list of narrators who were so deadly, who were so notorious for their fabrications against Ahlul Bayt and their fabrications promoting and supporting Ghulu that the scholars of Qum, they became fed up of them in the classical period and they drove them out. They expelled them and banished them from the city of Qum. But today you'll find their narrations are being narrated from the Mimbar. In fact, today's modern day Shia scholars, traditional scholars, regard those narrators who were expelled in the past very highly. So that's why Al-Fadl Al-Hairi is explaining, he's saying, look, if you read in the books of Rijal that a narrator was expelled from the city of Qum for lying against Ahlul Bayt, he says, yes, he might have been expelled from the city of Qum for lying against Ahlul Bayt, but we should continue to take narrations from this narrator. Why should we take narr narrations from this narrator? He's expelled from the city of Qum for lying against the Ahlul Bayt. And you are saying we, sh we should take narrations from him? So Al-Fadl Al-Ha'iri, Atul Al-Mamqani, they're all saying, yes, we should take narrations from such narrators. Say so why? He says, because Baba, read his statement. He says, for indeed most of our Shia scholars today, including some of the most reputed ones, would be considered ghali by the classical Shia scholars of Qum. And look at the statement. And if those classical scholars had encountered today's Shia scholars in Qum, and even in Najaf and elsewhere, they would have definitely expelled them from the city of Qum without a shadow of doubt. Because the times have changed so much. And today's Shiism has become so different. In fact, even the beliefs of today's scholars have become so different from what the classical Shia scholars used to believe to be the correct faith, that if the classical Shia scholars were to meet today's traditional Shia scholars, they would not even be willing to sit with them in the same place. They would immediately expel them from the city. Who is saying this? This is not my view or opinion. This is the view and opinion of Ayatollah al-Sheikh Abdullah al-Mamqani. And it is backed up by research. Because you read his 39 volumes of Ilm al-Rijal and you will see what he's talking about. There is so much that has changed. Today, the Shiism that people are following in the time of the Imams, in the world of the Quran, and in the time of the Imams, and in the time of the companions of the Imams, and in the times of the Classical Shia scholars, it was considered blasphemy, it was considered kufr, shirk, and ghulu. And Ayatollah al-Mamqani is not saying that, you know, okay, so now we need to change. 
because we have come a long way and we have introduced so much khurafat and all these things, we need to reverse it and go back to the time of the, or go back to the Shiism and the faith of the time of the Imams and the, and the time of the Quran. He's saying, no, 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 no. We have moved on and let us keep moving on. And if the classical, if you encounter texts in the classical and earliest sources telling you that Baba, this is Gulu, this is Shirk, this is Kufr, pay no attention to it. If today we are using narrations to prove a certain claim about the Imams, but then you examine the chain of that narration and you see, oh my God, the chain of this narration has got notorious Gulat, people who are expelled from the city of Qum for lying against Ahlul Bayt. Ayatollah Imam Khani is saying, ignore that. You take the narration from the person, even if he's expelled from the city of Qum by the classical Shia scholars. Why? Because he says, look, it's a known fact. Who are we, you know, hiding anything from? You can't hide this, this from anyone. It is a known fact that according to the classical Shiaism, today's Shiaism is blasphemy. It is heresy. It is deviation. And so now this is where the today's contemporary Shia scholars, they divide themselves into two groups. One group, the group, the, the traditional scholars led by Ayatollah al-Mamqani and Ayatollah Mar'ashi Najafi and all the other scholars that you see today in Qum, they will say, you know what? Even if the classical Shia scholars and even if the Imams themselves, they do not agree with our beliefs today, ignore that. Today, what has become established, what has become accepted among the scholars, that is what we will defend because, and I'll tell you why, they have, they have adopted this stance in a moment. But the first thing to understand is that there are two groups. One group says, look, if Shiism has degenerated, if it has become corrupted, if things have come into it, especially in the area of imamology, beliefs about imams, especially supernatural beliefs, that in the past were considered to be blasphemy and heresy, then abandon those beliefs, reject those beliefs and go back to the, the original teachings of Ahlul Bayt, which are preserved in the earliest sources, which agree with the Quran, this, the, this, these are the reformist scholars, scholars like Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah, scholars like Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Hubbullah, the student of Ayatollah Sayyid Mahmoud Al Hashmi Shahroudi, and scholars like Ayatollah Mal Al Haidari. Okay, these are all the great reformist scholars who are saying, you know what, all those things or all those areas where it is clear that. You have deviated from the Quran. You have deviated from the original authentic teachings of Ahlul Bayt. You've gone against them. Reverse that change and go back to the classical stance if it is supported by the Lili. So even what found to be in agreement with the actual teachings of the Imams and, and the Quran, that will be accepted. What is not found to be in agreement will be rejected. That is the stance of these reformist scholars. The traditional scholars, they say, no, no, no. So what if we have changed? You know, so what if we have just way that our faith is known from the city of Qum. Let them expel us from the city of Qum. We are happy with what we have inherited today. And indeed, what these traditional Shia scholars have inherited is the legacy of the Safavids. Many of the uh, traditions and narrations and rituals which had been dismissed by the classical Shia scholars and which had been rejected and thrown into the dustbin, the Safavid scholars, because they were very much interested in creating a unique sectarian identity for the Shias to protect themselves from being absorbed by the Ottoman because of that by resurrecting the narrations which had been rejected by the classical Shia scholars and dismissed on account of their they are being populated by liars and they're being fabricated by well-known liars they took all those discredited narrations and they revived the this is the correct teaching of Ahlul Bayt and even if the narrators are liars according to the classical scholars we'll reject the statements of the classical scholars and we will base our deen on these rejected statements because these rejected things are what give Shiism a, an identity that makes it completely different from what the rest of the Ummah believes and practices. And at, in the Safavid period, that's what the ulama were most interested in. They were like, you know what, if we don't make Shiism different from Sunnism, then the Ottoman Empire is busy devouring all the surrounding empires, all the other countries. The Ottoman Empire was annexing territories. There were very fond of conquests and they would go and they would attack even Muslim lands and they would capture Muslim terror and make them part of the Ottoman Empire. So Iran had its own empire, the Safavid Empire, and these people feared that very soon, and indeed they were right because the Ottomans, they did then have a battle. They fought a wars with the, there were Safavid Ottoman wars. 
and the Ottomans were obviously very powerful. They defeated the Safavids in, in uh, at least one major battle. They defeated them very badly. So the Safavids, even after this battle and even before, they realized that we need to do something. The Ottomans are going to absorb us. And right now, the Shi'ism that we have inherited from the classical period, that Shi'ism is very similar to Sunnism. It doesn't differ with the Sunnis on major issues. It's just one issue of who was supposed to be the Khalifa after the Prophet. Uh, the classical Shia believe that Imam Ali al-Islam was more qualified. The Sunnis believe that, no, the Ummah had its own you know, decision and, and that's it. And, and a few areas of fiqh. But the, the Safawid scholars, you're like, no, no, we need to make Shiism so much more different from Sunnism and the rest of the uh, Muslim uh, sects that tomorrow, if the Ottomans, they invade Persia, they invade Iran, they should encounter a completely new species of, of Muslims who are completely, you know, unamenable to being influenced by or being subsumed and being absorbed by the dominant Ottoman Sunni influence. So for the Safavids, it was a battle of survival. And that is why they introduced a lot of these unique things within Shiism that in the past were considered to be blasphemy. But the Safavids introduced them nonetheless, um, a new identity and a separate identity from the rest of the Ummah. And inshallah, if we have the opportunity, I'll show you. One of the first things that they did was they introduced the third Shahada in Azan. And not just the third Shahada in Azan, but generally the whole focus on Wilaya and Imama and all these things. They basically looked at all those things which uh, the Ghulat had invented. Because the Ghulat, even in the classical period, the project of the Ghulat was to separate the Shia from the mainstream Ummah. And so they also came up with a version of Shiism that was completely at odds with what the rest of the Ummah was believing in. And so... But then obviously the classical Shia scholars, they demolished the claims of the Ghulat and they suppressed them and they buried them. But in the Safavid period, all that buried evidence was resurrected by the Safavids and it was made standard Shia doctrine. So this is uh, what Adullah Mamqani is, is focusing when he's writing. He says, for indeed most of our Shia scholars today, including some of the most reputed ones, would be considered Ghali by them, that is by the classical Shia scholars of Qum. And if those classical scholars had encountered today's Shia scholars in Qum, they would have definitely expelled them from it without a shadow of doubt. And yes, he's not making a, it seems like he's making an outlandish claim. But actually, if you recall the very first lecture of the Al-Islah series, I gave you the example of Ayatollah al marashi al Najafi when he was entering the Sahan Bibi Mas Masuma uh, of Qum. Uh, and he saw that, you know, the, the, the Azadari on that he wanted the people to stop and he told the people, please lower your voices. And Atullah al marashi al Najafi scolds him and he says, shut up. Uh, you know, Sakit, agar in Azadari Nabud, Namaz Jama'at Nabud, this Azadari has to go on because Salat al Jama'ah itself depends on this Azadari. If this event had happened in the classical center, the classical Qummis, the classical Shia Qummis were on the path of the Imams. In fact, not just the classical Qummis, if the Imams of Ahlul Bayt themselves had been present, if Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had been present, if Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam had been present, none of the Imams would tolerate this kind of behavior on the part of Sayyid al Marashi. Uh, they would never allow you to engage in anything when it's time for Salah. Imam al Hussein stopped the jihad. He put his life and limb under risk to offer Salat al Jama'ah with his Ashab and with his Ansar. And the same thing is said about Imam Ali alayhi salam in the Battle of Safin. So obviously, Ayatollah Sayyid Shahabuddin al Mashin Jafi is a highly revered traditional scholar. But this act of his shows you how far traditional scholars are from the original teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. The Ahlul Bayt. And the classical Shia scholars would never tolerate that any other action, even if it is zikr of Ahlul Bayt, even if it is majlis, even if it is something to do with Karbala, they would not allow anything at the time of Salah. They would never ever dream of saying that, look, put the Salah on the back burner and let's first, you know, have the Azadari with, with full uh, momentum. They would never say that. But Ayatollah Sayyid Shahabuddin al marashi Najafi, he actually... Uh, said that he said no azadari is more important and this salat al-jama'ah is basically and, and and all this salat that we are having this is secondary compared to the azadari and that's why the azadari should go on the muaddin has no right to stop anyone from doing azadari even though it's time for salat al-maghrib and it is salat al-maghrib is very delicate 
the time is very delicate. It's not like, you know, you can go and pray three hours later. No, it, it's qadha then. And, and the fadila time is elapses. But no, he doesn't care about fadila time. He doesn't care about Salat al-Maghrib. For him, aza is, is more important. So this is basically after the Safawid period. You will see if you read uh, and go deep into the Safawid period, you will see how the Safawids, they deliberately tried to introduce these concepts where, you know, they tried to replace some of the arkan of Islam by with the arkan that they invented themselves. You know, these morning rituals and everything. They are the first people to sideline the actual teachings of Islam in favor of these rituals. Because they were like, you know, Salah, if the Ottomans invade us tomorrow, okay, people are very particular about Salah, the Ottomans are going to have no problem. You know, it's going to suffer with hands into Ottoman hands and no one is going to feel any difference. Because the, if we as the Safawids, if we promote Salah, 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 and tomorrow the Ottomans come, they are Sunnis, they will also promote Salah, Salah, Salah. So the people will feel like nothing has changed. And so it will be very easy for the Ottomans to swallow us. But if we remove Salah, and in place of Salah, we introduce some unique rituals, which no other faith in the Muslim Ummah has, then tomorrow if the, Ottoman come, the Ottomans come into power and they invade our country, and they, it's going to be very difficult for them because the whole religion of the local population is going to be so different. The Ottomans themselves are going to scratch their hands and be like, what are we to do with these people? Like they don't pray or they pray, but when it's time for Azad, they don't pray. How do we manage religiously? the Ottomans will not be able to manage, <laughs> the population will prove unmanageable to them. Because, so that's what, that's what, that was the conspiracy and the political uh, machination of the Safawids, is they wanted to turn Shiism into something so unique and so different that if, God forbid, the Ottomans do end up swallowing Iran as they intended to, they should not be able to easily win over the people. And, you know, the people themselves should not accept the Ottomans. So this was their this was their plan, and for this reason, they did these kinds of things. And unfortunately, today the average Shia is the one who is suffering from this. I'll relate to you a personal episode. Uh, this is basically from the time when I was uh, lecturing at a center in the United States of America. So I was lecturing at a Hoja community, and. Uh, so these ladies, these Indian Pakistani ladies, they come to me, they are Shia ladies, and they complain to me. They say, so we were talking about the community and community events and everything. And uh, when the zikr of the Khoja community came up, I was full of praises for, for the Khoja community. I was like, mashallah, they do everything very nicely in a very organized manner. Everything is, you know, according to time, praising them. And so these Daisy ladies, are, and they, they turn to me and they say, Sayyidna, yes, you're right. They're, mashallah, very nice people. But we have one major complaint against the Khoja ladies. We would love it if you could address this in the majlis. I was like, okay, what complaint do you have against our Khoja sisters? They said, look, they're very nice people, very good akhlaq, everything. But there's one major problem that we face with them, which is that we have majlis in the morning, okay? And in the morning... Uh, so basically somewhere around from 10 o'clock, the majlis starts 11 o'clock. And then after the majlis is obviously matam and everything. And very soon the time for Salatul Zuhr, 12, 30, 1 o'clock, it's time for Salatul Zuhr. As soon as the time for Salatul Zuhr comes, we, the rest of the ladies, we have not even finished our matam. You know, we still want to recite a few more nawhas and this and that. So, okay, so what is the complaint? So they're like, you know, you need to explain to these khoja ladies that Aza is... You know, it, aza is, is, is more important, okay? Salato we can pray later on, but azadari, when azadari is going on, they should not stop us, okay? They come and stop us and they, and at that moment, I remember thinking to myself, I was like, wow, so this is what our communities have. These khoja ladies, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. They are reviving the teaching of Ahlul Bayt. They are standing true to the teaching of Ahlul Bayt. I asked these ladies, I said, so this, all these years, these majalis you've been hearing from the member, they have had no impact on you. How many times have you heard the dhakir recite from the member that when it was time for Salat al-Zuhr on the day of Ashura in Karbala, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam stopped his jihad. His jihad was more important. His jihad was for Islam. Okay. He was trying to defend the true Islam, which Rasulullah stood for. So he could have easily argued that, Baba, what kind of salah right now? Right now, jihad is more important. We have to defend our lives. But no, he gave precedence to salah because salah to amudu deen, salah is the pillar and foundation of the religion.
If it is accepted, everything else is accepted. If it is rejected, everything else is rejected. So, but unfortunately, because of the kind of messaging that has gone out from the member, despite the fact that these events are mentioned from the member, somehow the messaging is such that, you know, even within our communities at the level of our ladies and even gents, there are many people who have not even understood that the importance of salah, and they have not understood this basic fact that at the time of salah, when we say hayya ala khayril amal, it is khayrul amal, meaning it is the best of actions. There can be so many other actions you can do right now. Reciting Quran is very nice. You know, giving zakah is very nice. Uh, attending to your parents is very nice. There's so many good deeds, but this is khayrul al amal. This is the best. Right now, there is no action that is more pleasing to Allah than salah. So leave everything and go and offer the salah. But subhanAllah, these Shia ladies in, in, in the center, they are complaining and they're saying, you know what? You need to explain and lecture the Khoja ladies and tell them that they should not do this. I said, Baba, the only one who needs a lecture here in this case is you. You need to be told that the Ahlul Bayt, والسلام, the, what these Khoja ladies are doing is the actual teaching of Ahlul Bayt. The Ahlul Bayt would have supported these Khoja ladies. They would have said, yes, leave everything, even if you are doing dhikr of Allah or other forms of, you know, you know, majlis or anything, leave it and go for salah. But now you see the problem becomes complicated when suppose these ladies were to then bring the example of Ayatollah al marash Najaf and they were to say, well, he was such a highly revered scholar. But even he said this, even he said that, you know, when it's Azar versus Salah, Azar needs to be given uh, precedence. So that is when you need to explain these people that, look, yes, if you're going to, uh, we don't deny Ayatollah Marashi was of this opinion. And there are many others who would be of a similar opinion. There are many scholars even today, there are many Zakirin, many Maulanas who would support the, the Desi ladies and they would oppose the, the Khoja ladies. But the choice you have to make, are you going to support what the traditional scholars or people of today are saying? Or do you want to follow what the Ahlul Bayt, what the original teachings of Islam are as preserved in the Quran and the early teachings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam. So that is a choice you have to make. The message, messaging and a teaching of the Ahlul Bayt is very clear. At the time of Salah, nothing else can be given precedence. But unfortunately, you find that in our communities, this is not being acted upon in many instances. So in any case, um, we would like to move on. So here we have another statement by Ayatollah al-Mamqani. He says, <clears throat> yeah, so this is in volume 6, page 340. He says, أَكْثَرْ مَا الآن so the explanation for how do we explain uh, what uh, uh, Sayyid al Marashi Najafi did or what so many of the Zakirin recite about the Ahlul Bayt from the Mimbar, so many of the claims that are being made, so many of the beliefs about Ahlul Bayt within Shiism today, particularly their supernatural, superhuman status. Adullah Mamkani explains this in one sentence. He says, Look, وَحَيْثُ إِنَّ الْغُلُوَ عِنْدَ الْقُدَمَاءِ يُنْسَبُ إِلَى الرَّجُلِ بِأَدْنَى شَيْءٍ بل أكثر ما نعتقده الآن في أهل البيت عليهم السلام كانوا يوم إذن يسمونه غلوة. He says, look, one thing you need to understand very clearly, okay, that أكثر ما نعتقده الآن في أهل البيت. Most of what we believe about the أهل البيت عليهم السلام today كانوا يوم إذن يسمونه غلوة. In the past, they used to consider it غلو. So if today you believe that Aza is more important than Salah, in the classical period of Shiaism, if you went ahead and made a claim like this. The ulama of Qum and Najaf and, and every Shia scholar worth his salt in the past would expel you from the city for making a claim like this. If you claim that the Ahlul Bayt have supernatural powers that Allah has given them and that they can respond to our supplications for making a claim like this, you could get expelled from the city of Qum and Najaf in the classical period because they would say this is blasphemy. This is kufr. This is shirk. If you claimed any of these unique supernatural, superhuman claims that are made about the Imams in the classical period, you would definitely, and even not just supernatural claims, any of the unique claims of today, as you will see later on uh, in this presentation, you could get expelled from Qum for making claims that are today considered to be very normal. In even the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, for example, last lecture, I shared with you that narration where Imam al-Sadiq is informed by his slave or his servant Musadif 
that a group, group of people, when they were setting out for Hajj, they said, Labbayka Ja'far ibn Muhammad. Today, if you look at our communities, how common is it for you to hear the slogan, Labbayka Ya Hussein? Hmm? Same thing in our oldest and most authoritative textbook of Ilm al-Rijal, Rijal al-Kashi, you have a narration saying the same thing about Imam Ja'far. A group of Shia from Kufa, these are Ghulat, they set out for Hajj and instead of saying Labbayk Allahumma, they say Labbayk Ja'far ibn Muhammad. They say our Labbayk is to Imam Ja'far. You know, we are at his service. So shifting the focus away from Allah to whom? To an Imam of Ahlul Bayt. What was Imam Sadiq's reaction? He fell into sujood and he began to tremble and shudder and shiver. And he said, Abdulillah, I'm a slave of Allah. How dare these people say Labbayk to me instead of saying Labbayk to Allah. So the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, what they considered blasphemy, what they considered shocking, today it is Adi. Today, no issue, no problem. It's become a common slogan, a common mantra throughout the month of Muharram. You will see people repeating this slogan and mentioning it and no one considers it blasphemy or heresy. This is what Atullah Mamkani is saying. That from small, small things to big, big things, a lot of the things that you people are saying, claiming, believing about the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Today you are okay with it, but the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they would have been shocked. They would have repudiated, repudiated these claims. They would have renounced you and disassociated themselves from you. And indeed the Quran tells us that on the day of judgment, all the pious slaves of God will disassociate themselves from all those of their followers who made them the focus of their devotion instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you have the statement by Sayyid Ali al-Burjurdi, again confirming the, this is again evidence of the overthrow. He says, وَبِالْجُمْلَةِ أَلْظَاهِرْ أَنَّ الْخُدَمَاءَ كَانُوا مُخْتَلِفِينَ فِي الْمَسَائِلِ الْأُصُولِيَّةِ فَرُبَّمَا كَانَ شَيْءٌ عِنْدَ بَعْضِهِمْ فَاسِدًا أَوْ كُفْرًا أَوْ غُلُوًا وَعِنْدَ آخَرِينَ عَدَمُهُ بَلْ مِمَّا يَجِبُ لِعْتِقَادُ بِهِ so that sometimes something according to them would be invalid, it would be batil, it would be corrupt, it would constitute kufr and disbelief and ghulu. But according to later Shia scholars, particularly the Safawid ones and the post Safawid scholars of today, it would be regarded not only as okay, but obligatory to believe in. So he says that when you see the, the jarh of the classical scholars, uh, you need to take it with a pinch of salt because majority of the things that they are discrediting narrators for today, they are established parts of Shia belief. Now, if this is the case, if an overthrow has taken place, then why is it that the Shia scholars of today are silent about it? This is a question that has been repeatedly been asked during this series. A lot of people are saying, okay, so if there has been an overthrow, if there is a world war going on, if so much of what's happening today is wrong and against the teaching of Ahlul Bayt, then where are the scholars? So my answer throughout the series has been that there are, two, there are two groups of scholars. There's one group of scholars who have written against this and they have spoken out against this. If you are not listening to them or if you've not read their writings, that's your problem. These scholars, they have completed the hujjah. They've said, look, we have made the hujjah. We have cleared our record before Allah. That we told the people that these, these things are wrong. That's one group of scholars. The other group of scholars are people like Ayatollah al-Marashi and Najafi, who themselves have bought into the Safa with propaganda. So now they genuinely and honestly think and believe in things like Aza being more important than Salah. So these scholars themselves, they have become, they have deviated and they've become misguided. Now, if a scholar himself is misguided, then how do you expect him to guide the masses, right? And this is what you see some of the scholars, Allah quotes them in the Quran and Surah Al-Qasas, particularly when it comes to shirk, Allah says, I will question many of the scholars who supported and promoted shirk. And I will say, why did you do this? Did you not know the truth? They will respond by saying, They will point to their followers whom they misguided. And they'll say, ya Allah, these are the people whom we misguided, but don't blame us. They say, ya Allah, we misguided them just as we ourselves were misguided. So you can't accuse us of fraud or corruption. Corruption is when I know the truth and I'm misguiding someone and telling the, the person the opposite of it. This group of scholars on the Day of Judgment, they're saying, Ya Allah, we didn't know the truth. We ourselves were taken for a ride and we were ourselves deceived. So if we ourselves were deceived and deviant, how do you expect us to have guided these bichara people who are blindly following us? So you have some scholars who belong to this category. They are genuinely influenced by Hulu themselves. So you cannot expect them to speak out against something that they themselves are suffering from. 
Okay, so how can I treat a disease when I'm suffering from it myself? That's a second group of scholars. The third group of scholars, and this is a, where a lot of very high level maraja might even fall, is this is a group of scholars who know all of what has gone wrong and they admit it in their advanced level writings and also among insider Hausa circles. So a lot of times studying the taqrirat, the reports and scripts of these advanced qum and subhanallah, if someone were to just translate some of the stuff that these grand maraja, they say inside the classroom with their top level mujtahid students, you will be amazed. The things meet over there, they understand that a lot of these things cannot be shared with them because the public may not handle this kind of information and they fear reprisal from the public. And if you will share with you an evidence, for example, Ayatollah Saleh in Najaf Abadi was a great reformist scholar. Uh, from Iran and uh, he was he studied under the top uh, maraja of his time including Ayatollah Sayyid Hussein al-Burujurdi. Ayatollah Sayyid Hussein al-Burujurdi is one of the grand maraja uh, of the, the 50s. He died in 1961. Some of the grand maraja, the most famous of them have, have been students of Sayyid al-Burujurdi. Okay, Ayatollah Khomeini is a student of Sayyid al-Burujurdi. Ayatollah Ja'far Subhani, student of Sayyid al-Burujurdi. Ayatollah Khamenei, student of Sayyid al-Burjardi, Ayatollah uh, Shaheed uh, Sayyid Muhammad Hussain Bahishti, student of Sayyid Hussain al-Burjardi. Uh, all of these grand, Shaheed Murtada Mutahari, Muhammad Hussain Bahishti, all of these are known to be scholars of Ayatollah as Sayyid Hussain al-Burjardi. Look at what he says in his lectures. When he is giving uh, lessons on Salat al-Jum'ah, he explicitly tells his students, he says, you, my students, are surprised at how when we, the scholars in the Maraja, when we tell you that Imam al-Sadiq would sometimes do taqiyya in front of his opponents and the government, you are surprised at that because he had some critical students who used to raise questions about this. That how can an Imam actually, you know, say the opposite of the truth? Because that's what you do under taqiyya. You know the truth, but you say the opposite of it to save your life or to save yourself from harm or danger. So... Sayyid al-Burjurdi says, you are surprised at how Imam al-Sadiq would do taqiyya in front of his opponents and the government and give a verdict against what he knew to be true. Sayyid al-Burjurdi, he says, there is no room for surprise here because we have also reached a point where we fear our own followers so much that we do not dare to write a verdict or opinion that is against what is famous among the jurists in our Risala. And this is so true. If you read what they say in their advanced level discussions inside the Hausa seminaries and you compare that with what they write in the Risala Amaliyah, you will see a difference of the heaven and the earth. What they are saying over there, they don't say over here. Why? The answer is given by Sayyid al burjurdi who was the chief of the Hausa in his time. He was a very powerful and influential scholar. He controlled the Hausat. And yet he is saying that even I don't have the freedom and liberty to give my verdicts and my fatawa according to what I know to be true based on the evidence in front of me. I can't do that. I have to support what the popular opinion among the scholars is because he's not the only scholar, right? There are many other scholars who came before him, who are contemporaneous with him. He says, I have to toe their line because if I go against what they have said, then I have to face the consequences and the fire and brimstone is going to rain down upon me from the public. So you can see you also have some grand level scholars of the level of Sayyid al-Burujardi, who is a teacher of many of the grand maraja today, including maraja like Ayatollah Wahid al-Khurasani and these others. And he's saying, yeah, even I cannot be outside this classroom. I cannot give fatawi that I know to be true. I have to do taqiyya from my own followers. So I hope this answers the question that many of you have been asking throughout the series, which is that where are the ulama and what are the ulama doing? Well, there are different groups. There's one group of ulama who know everything because they have studied uh, too deeply to be in doubt or to be in ignorance of these things. They have studied all of this. They know that there are a lot of problems with Shiism as it is being practiced today. But they cannot go against the rest of the scholars. They fear reprisal of the public. And that's why they just keep quiet. And inside, in their insider Hausa circles, they admit the truth. But when it's in public forums, they have to toe the line of the establishment. Otherwise, 
they get blacklisted and then they face problems. Uh, Ayatollah Sayyid Fadlullah is a classical case in point. When he spoke and he shared many of his researches, people did not welcome it. Instead of welcoming it and tolerating it, they started labeling him as Dal and Mudil, as Imam al Dalala. He, that he's the Imam of misguidance and error, even though he was such a high level scholar that Ayatollah Sayyid Shaheed. Muhammad Baqr al-Sadr is reported to have said about him when he left the city of Najaf. He said, Kullu man taraka al-Najaf khasira al-Najaf illa al-Sayyid Muhammad Hussain fadlullah fa inna al-Najafa khasirahu. He said, everyone who leaves the city of Najaf, it is his loss because Najaf is the city of knowledge. It is where all the, you know, Grand Maraja used to be. It's the traditional center of learning and it's been like that for centuries. So anyone who leaves Najaf, it is his loss. It is not the loss of Najaf, except in one case. I told the Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Baqr al-Sadr. He says, except for one person. When he left Najaf, it was not his loss. It was our loss. It was the loss of Najaf. Who, pray tell, could be that person? I told the Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Baqr al-Sadr says, it is I told the Sayyid Muhammad Hussain Fadlullah. When he left Najaf, it was the loss of Najaf. So can you imagine such a high level, massively well-credentialed scholar who has ijazah of ishtihad from the top maraja of his time, Yet, when on a host of, you know, reformist issues, small, small issues, when he raised his voice and he spoke out against what was common, what was popular, he was immediately labeled, he was branded, people cursed him, abused him, and they did so much. And the ulama also, they jumped on the bandwagon. So, Ayatollah Jawad al-Tabrizi and these others, they were at the forefront. And that's why Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Zain Fadlullah used to say, that on the day of judgment, if I meet uh, Sayyida Fatima, my grandmother, I will complain to her about the, what these shuyukh have, have done to me and how they have backbited me and slandered me and cast aspersions against me for no crime except that I brought out research. Ultimately, a person has reached the station of ijtihad. Ijtihad means taqlid is haram for him now. So how can you expect him to toe the line of the rest of the scholars? In the ijazah of ijtihad, they write it for you. They say it is haram for you to do taqlid now. So on the one hand, you are telling a scholar like Ayatollah Fadlullah, look, you cannot follow what the rest of the scholars are saying. You have to do your own research now because you are a mujtahid. Okay, so he does his own research and God forbid he reaches conclusions which are different from the conclusions that you, you have reached. So you immediately label him and brand him Imam al-Dalala and Dal and Mudil. What kind of logic is this? Either you don't give him ijtihad. Huh? You tell him you just close your eyes and follow what the rest of the scholars are saying. But no, they give you ijazah of ijtihad. When you start applying the ijtihad, they say, okay, as long as you apply ijtihad to agree with us, you are okay. We will praise you. We'll give you more ijazahs. But the moment you use your ijtihad and by applying your reasoning, you reach a conclusion that is against what we agree with, then we will brand you as a, as an imposter, as someone who is fraudulent, as someone who is ignorant, as someone who is deviant and misguided, and God knows all these other labels. So what's going on? What's going on is that a lot of the scholars are then fearful of this. And as a result, the public remains in the dark. The public doesn't get to know what the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, for example, really said about Salatul Jumu'ah. Why? Because Sayyid al burjurdi is saying, you know what, I have to, in my Risala, I have to write what the rest of the scholars have said. What my own research says, I can discuss with you in this closed room, in this high advanced level Hausa classroom, where I know everyone is mature enough, no one is going to create a controversy, so I can discuss all of this. But if I go outside and I share my real research, they're going to say, oh, he's Dal Mudil, Imam al Dalala, and they will brand me. So that's why I'm not going to share my knowledge with people who don't have the maturity to handle it. So a lot of the top level scholars are silent and not speaking out because of this. And remember, Ayatollah al-Burujurdi is a very high level scholar. If you just look at the list of his students, you will realize what a massively high level scholar we are talking about. So if this is his, his hal, then you can imagine the hal of the other scholars. Now we come to, uh, in the remaining time quickly, we wanna go through how the Ghulat attempted to overthrow Islam. So they started by uh, attempting to overthrow the Quran, which is the most central text of Islam. So this is the narration that they came up with. Inna al-Qur'an alladhi jaa bihi Jibreelu ila Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam sab'ata sab'atu ashara alf ayah. 
the Quran which Jibreel came with to the Holy Prophet had 17,000 verses in it. The Ghulat, they attribute this narration to whom? To Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Where do they do it and where is it recorded? In Al-Kafi. This is in Al-Kafi, volume 2, uh, Kitab Fadl al-Quran, in the, the section of Al-Kafi where he's talking about the excellence of the Quran and the virtues of the Quran. This narration he mentions in Babu Nawadir, the Bab of, you know, uh, these rare narrations. So this narration has actually, if you look at the chain, uh, Al-Kulaymi provides us with a truncated and abridged chain, uh, which is Ali ibn al-Hakam from Hisham ibn Salim from Imam al-Sadiq. But the full chain, you will get it from the previous narrations because this is the style of Al-Kulaymi. He mentions the full chain and then later on when he has to refer to the same chain, he abridges it, he truncates it. So the full chain is Muhammad ibn Yahya and Ahmad ibn Muhammad and Ali ibn al-Hakam and Hisham ibn Salim and Abi Abdullah. Now, what is the problem with this chain? The problem is here. Muhammad ibn Yahya narrates from Ahmad ibn Muhammad. This is where many scholars of Rijal in the past, particularly in the Safawid period, they fell into a misunderstanding. They thought, they thought Ahmad ibn Muhammad is Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Isa, al-Ash'ari al-Qummi al-Razi, the, the grand chief of the classical Qummi scholars. They thought he is narrating this narration from Ali ibn al-Hakam, from Hijam ibn Salim, that Imam al-Sadiq said the, the real Quran which Jibreel had brought had 17,000 verses. And you know the implications of this. <laughs> if the real Quran had 17,000 verses, then that means two-thirds of the Quran we don't have. We just, because the Quran that we have has 6,000 odd verses. So where did the rest of the verses disappear? So they disappeared. We don't have them. This is the claim that's being attributed to Imam al-Sadiq by the Ghulat, as you will see. But this Ahmad ibn Muhammad is where the confusion took place. So there are actually two Ahmad ibn Muhammads. One of them is Ahmad, well, there are multiple Ahmad ibn Muhammads, but in this case, the confusion was between two. This Ahmad ibn Muhammad actually was Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Sayyar, for whom Najashi, the great classical scholar of Rijal, this is what he writes. He says that he used to live in the time of Abu Muhammad alayhi salam. His title is as Sayyari. He is da'if al-hadithi fasid al-madhab. He is weak in hadith and of corrupt aqidah. His aqidah is corrupt. He is majfur riwaya. al Hussein ibn Ubaidillah, that is Ibn al-Ghadairi, used to say that he is majfur riwaya. His riwayat are not to be accepted. He is kathir al-marasil. He narrates many incomplete narrations. And he has a number of books that he has compiled. One of them is Kitab Thawab al-Quran and the other is Kitab al-Qira'at. And they used to narrate his narrations except ma kana min ghuluwin wa takhlid. Except the ghulu and confusing aspects of his narrations in the past, they would not narrate them. So this is an admission on the part of Najashi that there is ghulu and takhlid and confusing stuff to be found in his narrations. Then this is what Sheikh Abu Ja'far al-Tusi, again in the fifth century, he's a classical Shia scholar of al Rijal. This is what he says about Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Sayyad, the narrator of the 17,000 narration. He says he's da'if al-hadith, he's weak in hadith, fasid al-madhab, he's deviant in terms of his aqidah, majfu al-riwayah, his riwayah should not be taken, kathir al-marasil, he narrates a lot from um, a lot of mursal narrations, and again he talks about how there was ghulu and confusing things, uh, stuff in his narrations. Then you have the kingpin of the classical Shia Rijalist, Sheikh Ibn al-Ghadairi. Narrator, we know him very well. He's known as a Sayyari Da'ifun Mutahalik. This person is weak and he is a person who is sworn to destruction. He will be destroyed in the Akhirah because of the kind of hadith he fabricated. Ghalin, he is a Ghali Muharrif. He's a believer in Tahrif and he Changes the narrations of the Imams. Istathna shuyukhul qummiyina riwayatahu min kitabi nawadir al-hikmah. The chief of the qummis, they used to exclude his narrations from the books. Wa haka mubnu alim mahmahu fi kitabi nawadir al-musannafa anna hu qala bit tanasuf. He used to believe in reincarnation and other kinds of deviant beliefs. Wa da'afahu. And he has been discredited by all these classical scholars, by Sheikh Muhammad ibn al-Hassan ibn Ahmad ibn al-Walid, who is the teacher of Sheikh al-Saduq. Similarly, Sheikh Abu Ja'far, Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Babawai al-Qummi, Sheikh al-Saduq, 
Abu al-Abbas ibn Nuh and Najashi, they have all discredited this narrator. And they have declared him. So you can easily see that there was a consensus among the classical Shia scholars with regard to the unreliability of a sayyari the guy who, who claims that Imam al-Sadiq said the Quran has 17,000 verses. But as soon as the Safawi period comes in, you see they are now beginning to reverse the stance of the classical scholars. So what do the scholars of the Safawi period have to say about this narration? So we start with Allah Muhammad Taqil Majlisi, okay, from the 11th century Hijri. He, in his book, Rawdatul Al-Muttaqeen Fi Sharhi Akhbar al al Asumin, volume 10, page 21, while commenting on this narration, he says, no, 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 this 17,000 narration, this is sahih, this is authentic. So, hey, how is it authentic? All the classical scholars have discredited the narrator. They've said he's a dangerous ghali, he's a fabricator of hadith. He's not to be relied, but no, this, is the, this was before the Safawi period. Now in the Safawi period, they're beginning to promote this narration that no, 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 it is, it is sahih. So a fabricated narration, Muhammad Taqi al-Majlisi makes it sahih. His son, the famous al-Allama Muhammad Baqir al-Majlisi, the author of Bihar al-Anwar, known as the second Majlisi, Majlisi number two, he classified this narration as muwathaq, as reliable, in his commentary of al-Kafi entitled Mir'atul Uqul, in volume 12, page 525. He's also a Safawid scholar, and he also supports the authentication of the 17,000 verses of Quran narration. Then you have Al-Allama Sheikh Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Hur al-Amili, the author of Wasail al-Shia. He deems this narration and labels it as Sahih in his book Al-Fawaid at tusiya <clears throat> And this is the actual statement of Al-Allama Muhammad Baqir al-Majlisi when commenting on this narration. He says, فَالْخَبَرُ صَحِيحٌ This narration is authentic. وَلَا يَخْفَ أَنَّ هَذَا الْخَبَرُ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْ الْأَخَارِ الصَحِيحَةِ this is a very important statement. We will, I guess I'm running out of time, but we, I want to focus a little bit on this. He says this narration is sahih, it is authentic. And it should not be hidden from anyone that this narration, as well as many other similar narrations and akhbar, which are authentic, are explicit in declaring that the Quran is not complete. The Quran that you have today is not complete. It has been changed. And he says, He says, if you ask me, the narrations we have in the books of the Shia school, which claim that tahrif has taken place. Those narrations are so many in number that they are mutawatir in terms of ma'na. So because they are mutawatir, we cannot reject them. We have to accept them because we have too many narrations claiming that there is tahrif in Quran. The Quran is not complete. And then he explains why we should, we have to accept those narrations which claim that the Quran is not complete. He says, because the Shia books are full of such narrations. And the, such narrations exist in such large quantities that وَطَرْحُ جَمِيعِهَا يُجِبُ رَفْعَ الْإِعْتِمَادِ عَنِ الْأَخْبَارِ He says, if we reject these narrations, despite their large quantity, that is going to completely uh, destroy the faith of the people in our narrations. Because once you realize that, there, that our books of hadith have thousands of narrations supporting a false concept, then basically that is game over for all the beliefs of the Shia Madhab that are based on Hadith. All, all those beliefs, they go into the dustbin. Why? Because, if the, because it will be proven that Tahrif al-Quran, if you're going to base your deen on the Akhbar, on the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, or narrations which have been attributed to the Ahlul Bayt, then the Ghulat have invented so many narrations and attributed them to the Ahlul Bayt, that if you are going to rely on the narrations, you're going to end up with the belief that the Quran is not complete. So he says, we cannot allow the people to lose faith in the narrations. Because if we tell them that the Quran is not uh, incomplete, we tell them it is complete. The people will say, then what about those thousands of narrations saying that the Quran is incomplete, that it has 17,000 verses. And those are Shia narrations and Shia books attributed to Shia Imams. So what do we do about those narrations? So he says that you need to tell the people that 
these narrations have to be accepted because if you reject them, then they'll say, okay, so the rest of the beliefs which are based on narrations, reject those as well. So that's why he is of the view that we should, rejecting all of those narrations would lead us to losing faith in all the narrations because if so many false narrations can exist, then that means that narrations cannot be relied upon to begin with. And then he says, in my estimation, the akhbar and narrations about tahrif are no less than the narrations about imama. So he says, imama is also going to go outside the window. If you reject <clears throat> the belief in tahrif al-Quran, you will also have to re reject imama. Why? Because he says there is no evidence for imama in the Quran. The only evidence you have is in the akhbar, in the narrations. But narrations, you have already seen the narr from the narrations, even Tahrif al-Quran can be proved. So people will say if narrations uh, can prove Tahrif al-Quran and Tahrif al-Quran we all know is false, then Imama might also be false because Imama is also based on narrations. So how do we know those narrations are not false? So that is why Al-Alama Majlisi is of the view that we should not reject the hadith which claim Tahrif of Quran, such as the one that says Quran was supposed to have 17,000 verses. Because if you reject that, you might you will also have to reject Imama and you'll have to reject all other beliefs which are exclusively based on hadith and narrations. And even today, Ayatollah Hadi Ma'rifa, he points out in his book, he has written a special book on this topic. He says there are so many akhbar about this that Al-Muhaddis Al-Nuri, the akhbari scholar, was easily able to bring over 1100 narrations or rather 1122 narrations to be precise of which at least 200 narrations are such that even Ayatollah Hadi Ma'rifat had to admit that they are from books which are considered to be reliable and authoritative by the present day Shia scholarly establishment. So this is the big problem. The Ghulat have fabricated so many thousands of hadith that even false concepts, you can prove that they are proven by Tawatur. They are proven by thousands of narrations. So Allah Majlisi did not want to admit that the Shia Hadith corpus is so badly compromised that, you know, you can have over thousand, uh, 1,000 narrations just in support of Tahrif. Because he feared that that would undermine the other claims that the Shia Madhab has made, which have no support in the Quran, but which have thousands of narrations supporting them. So because of this reason, you find that he defends the narration in Tahrif al-Quran. Now, I don't know, I think we are running out of time, but I wanted to discuss why the Ghulat invented narrations undermining the Quran. So the simple answer was <clears throat> that the Quran has verses which negate and contradict so many of their cherished beliefs and claims. Number two, there is a glaring lack of support for their unique aqidah claims and worldview in the Quran. So this is the reason why the Ghulat were like, okay, if we believe the Quran that we have right now, this is the complete Quran, then this is big bala for us. Because then how are we going to, we are believing in so many things. The whole supernatural station and position of the Imams, the miracles of the Imams, the supernatural of powers of the Imams. None of that is mentioned in the Quran. In fact, the Quran negates all of that. So you need akhbar, you need narrations to prove these and narrations which are invented by the Ghulat. So the Ghulat said, look, we can invent thousands of narrations but until the Quran is alive and well, those narrations will get kicked out. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to undermine the Quran. We need to attack the Quran and convince the public that this Quran itself is not authentic. It is only 6,000 verses we have, right? The actual Quran had 17,000 verses. So the ulat, the story that they were trying to sell the people was that all the new beliefs and claims that we are bringing you, they must have been part of those, the, the two thirds of the Quran that disappeared, which you did not receive we are bringing you claims from there which he shared with us so this is why the ulat were interested in tahrif and the safawids were interested in tahrif because the quran severely undermines the belief in the reliability and authenticity of shia narrations because the quran is saying that we have revealed the quran and we shall be its protectors whereas the narrations are saying no allah billah, did not fulfill this promise he failed to protect the Quran. Over two thirds of the Quran evaporated into thin air. And all we have left today is one third of the Quran. So basically, the Ghulat and the Safawids, they worked together. And they promoted this myth that the Quran that you have is not complete. So that they can bring the Akhbar and the narrations to complete what the Quran has left incomplete. 
and so that they can convince the people to accept a lot of the beliefs and practices which have no trace in the Quran by telling them, because the, a regular Muslim, whenever you introduce a new belief or concept, he says, bring me evidence in the Quran. And there is no evidence for Ghulu in Quran. So you need narrations for that. But how do you bring the narrations in? By saying that this Quran is not complete and the narrations we are sharing with you, they will complete what the Quran is telling you. So basically, I think we will end with this much uh, because I think we are running out of time. Although there are some other areas that we might have gone into. Uh, but inshallah, we will reserve that for some future uh, opportunity. Uh, for now, I think I'm being asked to wind up and uh, open this for uh, Q&A. Thank you, Sayyid. Inshallah, we shall continue next time. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I will start with the first question. Um, when you uh, quote, when you quoted Ayatollah, when uh, Ayatollah Burjabi said uh, he is just doing what uh, Imam Sadiq did by uh, practicing taqiyya, what is this in reference to? And did Imam Sadiq actually do it or not? Right. <clears throat> so Im the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Ali was salatu was salam, our research is that they never did taqiyya. And the biggest proof is Imam al Hussein. Alayhi salam. I mean, if taqiyya, see, taqiyya, if your life is in danger, the Quran authorizes you and it allows you to utter blasphemy and to utter kufr to save your life. But this is for a normal, regular person. A prophet of God, for example, is not allowed to say that, oh, okay, I'm fearing for my life, so I'm going to distort the message of God or, or lie to the people. If you are a leader, if you are a guide for the people, you are not allowed to do taqiyya. So that's why the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, he faced so much torture and persecution in Mecca. People used to throw stones at him. They used to put thorns in his way. Did he ever preach shirk out of taqiyya? No. Did he ever utter kufr? No, even though his life was in danger. Even the very night that he left Mecca and migrated to Medina, the people wanted to do what? They wanted to kill him. His life was always in danger from day one, and yet he always promoted the truth, and he preached the message that Allah revealed to him. Not one day in his life you can show me that Rasulullah did taqiyya. Even though if taqiyya was allowed for him, he could have done it. He could have said, look, the people of Mecca are out for blood. They want to kill me. So sometimes I will, you know, speak the opposite. I will say that, yeah, these idols are, you can worship idols, for example, out of taqiyya. But no. Once you study Islam and you study the original sources, you will realize that people who are in the capacity of religious leadership, they are not allowed by Allah to do taqiyya. So even ulama, the Quran says, when Allah gave the kitab to the Ahlul Kitab, he said, You will make this book that I'm giving you clear to the people. You will make its teachings and its message clear to the people and you will not hide anything from it. You will not suppress the truth. Similarly, when Allah took mithaq of the ulama with regard to the Torah and other books, he said that uh, Allah told these scholars, he said, look, you will fear me, you will not fear the people. And you will not sell my ayat for a paltry and meager gain. So from ulama, from religious leaders, from prophets, Allah does not authorize. For them, Allah does not authorize taqiyya. For the bichara layperson, who is not a role model for others, who is not a guide for other people, if such a person does taqiyya to save his life, the Quran says, okay, no problem. Because your taqiyya is not going to cause any harm. Okay. So if an ordinary lay person out of fear and to save his life from the idol worshippers, if he does puja of an idol, you know, to save his life, this is not going to have any impact. Everyone knows that this is a lay person. He's not a role model. He's not someone we look up to for guidance. So it is okay for him to do taqiyya. But if someone like Rasulullah to save his life, he starts also worshipping an idol then this is going to set a very wrong precedent. You know, tomorrow someone can come and say, no, Rasulullah worshipped idols, na'udhu billah, so we can also do that. So that's why Rasulullah, it is a challenge. You cannot show us a single instance in history where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ever did taqiyya. 
He was not allowed to. He's a prophet. He has to speak the truth under all circumstances. The same thing with those who represent the prophet and who stand in his place as religious guides for the ummah or role models for the ummah, including scholars. They are not allowed to do taqiyya. Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Ghalib alayhi salatu wasalam, he never did taqiyya. Even though traditional Shia scholars will try to claim that he did taqiyya. They say he was shadidu taqiyya. He did too much taqiyya. But the reality is he never did taqiyya. He always spoke out the truth. Whenever the third caliph, for example, whenever he took a wrong decision, Imam Ali al-Islam was the first to protest against him. Why did he not do taqiyya and say, well, he's such a powerful caliph. If I speak out against him, he might harm me. He might. No, he spoke out. He spoke out. He went up to him personally and he admonished him. So where was his taqiyya? And then the biggest blow to the doctrine of taqiyya for imams is Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He had the perfect excuse for taqiyya. This Yazid is going to kill me. Yazid had made it very clear. I will kill you if you don't give me bay'ah. This is recorded in Tariq al-Tabari. So if he doesn't give bay'ah, behead him. Okay, so now my life is in danger. Imam al Hussein could have said taqiyya. I will give the bay'ah to save my life because it's saving life is also wajib. So yeah, saving life is wajib for the regular ordinary person. I am the grandson of Rasulullah and I am the deserving, I'm deserving of leadership of this ummah. I am a role model for this ummah. If I give bay'ah to Yazid and if I countersign his project of destroying Islam, then salam on Islam. Islam is over, game over. So Imam al Hussein, he laid down not only his life, but the life of his dearest and nearest Ahlul Bayt and his companions. Why? Precisely because he did not believe in taqiyya. He said, no, I accept it under any circumstance because this is far from them. They would have never condoned this. And besides, even if you look at it, logically speaking, if the claim is that the Imams did taqiyya and they lied to their own followers, na'udhu billah, his approach because what is the purpose of taqiyya? To save your life, yeah? So that the oppressor should not kill you. Well, according to the traditional narrative, most of the imams, they ended up getting killed anyways, right? All the imams, they were martyred, right? So even though they did, if the claim is that they did taqiyya and they lied to people to save their lives, they still ended up losing their lives. So what was the point of this taqiyya? If you ultimately you are going to die, you might as well stand up for the truth and then die rather than speak lies and get killed even though you speak lies. So this does not make sense. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt never did taqiyya, but then the Ghulat, they invented this concept that the Imams do taqiyya. Do you know why? Because the Ghulat very often, they were preaching a completely parallel alternative version of Shiism, right? Many of the claims that they used to make, the companions of the Imams would reject them on the spot and say, this claim you're making is false. I heard the Imam saying the opposite of this. So the Ghulat would tell these companions of the Imams, they would say, you know what? The Imam said that out of taqiyya. You know, he, he was fearing for his life, so he didn't say that. So what he told you was out of taqiyya. What he told us is the actual opinion of the Imam. And so they used this claim to fool many people into believing that what they were fabricating and attributing to the Imam is the actual truth. And what the trustworthy companions of the Imams are saying is stuff that the Imam may have said, but he said it under taqiyya, so it has no value. And unfortunately, to this very day, many of the maraja they accept this idea. And that's why at the advanced level, ilm al-usul, they teach. There's a whole subject that they teach you called ta'arud al-adilla shar'iyya. It's a, it's a dawra, it's a part of a halaqa, it's part of the course. They teach you what to do with contradictory evidences. Because when you, once you study the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt, you will see a lot of contradiction in the books of hadith. In one narration, the Imam is saying this is halal. In another, he's saying it's haram. In one narration, he's saying, for example, you can pray with your hands folded, no problem. In another, he's saying, no, you can't. In one, he's saying, you don't need to do sajda on soil or natural things. You can do sajda on anything. In another, he's saying, no, you can't. So much contradiction. That is why there is a whole module that the Maraja and the Mujtahideen have designed called Ta'arud al-Adilla Shar'iyya, in which they teach you how to deal with contradiction. You have one hadith saying that the Imam said this, and another hadith saying the exact opposite. In fact, there are scholars like Al-Wahid al-Bahbani who claim that there is no hadith of the Imam except for which there is an, a contradictory statement. In most of the abab of fiqh, you have contradictions. 
So the marajah, because they want to derive laws, this is a big problem for them. Which set of narrations do I believe in? So they apply a number of principles for tarjih, to give precedence to one set of narrations or the other. The first uh, criterion is agreement with the Quran. So if two sets of narrations, you look at which one agrees with the Quran, you accept it. You look at the one that disagrees with the Quran, you reject it. But suppose you have a narration which neither agrees with the Quran nor contradicts, then you study the chain. You see which one is trustworthy, which one is not. Sometimes you have uh, a narration that is being narrated by chains, contradictory narrations. Both of them are, are, are reliable by traditional Rajali standards. So then what do you do? So in many cases, what they do is they have another additional layer of filtering, which is they say, whatever agrees with the action of the mainstream Muslims, you reject that. On what grounds? On grounds that the Imam must have said it in Taqiyah. And what disagrees with the practice of the mainstream Muslims, you accept that and you act on that. They have made this into a principle. And this principle is justified on grounds that, yes, the Imams used to do Taqiyah. So the idea is that any narration in which the Imam agrees with the mainstream Muslims, he is doing it because he's fearing for his life. So he's speaking lies, na'udhu billah. And he's trying to placate and appease the mainstream Muslims. But the real fatwa is the fatwa that is attributed to him in which he is opposing the action of the mainstream Muslims. Whereas if you research both sets of narrations, in most cases, you will see that the narrations which uh, claim that the imams preached the opposite of what the mainstream Muslims are doing, those narrations have ghulat in their chains. And those narrations which claim that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are promoting what the mainstream Muslims are doing, those have trustworthy companions in their chains, non ghulat companions. So you can very clearly see a conspiracy that the ghulat are attributing everything. They want to turn Shias into a separate sect, right? They want them to be completely different from the mainstream. So everything the mainstream is doing, the ghulat are inventing narrations, attributing them to the imams and making the imams say that what the mainstream Muslims are doing is wrong. You do this in this way. So, and then this is justified by using the principle of taqiyah saying that, because obviously the narration of the original companions, it's, it's still in the sources. And it's saying that the imam supported the action of the mainstream Muslims. So they say, yeah, he supported it, but he supported it out of taqiyah, out of fear for his life, na'udhu billah which is not the case. So coming to your question, Sayyid al-Burjurdi saying that, you know, yeah, Sayyid al-Burjurdi himself, he believes that Imams do taqiyya. This is what he's teaching his students. And some of his students, like Ayatollah Saleh in Najaf Abadi, he's a critical reformist scholar. He says, no, 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 this does not make sense to me. How can Imam al-Sadiq do taqiyya? He's such a great level Imam. If he starts doing taqiyya, and if he's lying to his own companions and telling them false ahadith and telling them wrong stuff just to save his life, then what kind of imam is this? How can we follow such an imam? So Sayyid al-Burjirdi is responding by saying, he's saying, why are you finding it so surprising that Imam, imam al-Sadiq would do taqiyah? Look at me, your teacher. I am having to do taqiyah from my own followers. So if I am doing taqiyah from my own followers, why can't the imam also do taqiyah from the rest of the Muslims or from the oppressors? So that's his hujjah. We accept the first part, uh, or rather, we reject the first part, but we accept the second part. Yani Sayyid al burjudis claim that Sadiq used to do taqiyya. We don't accept that because that does not go, that is not in line with the evidence. But his statement that I do taqiyya with the, from the public, yeah, that is, he's speaking about himself. So he knows better and it is true. There are so many grand marajah who unfortunately, because the public is not mature enough and they're not receptive to new researches, they end up having to do taqiyya with their own people. And a great example of that is the father of Allama Majlisi. This goes way back, Al Allama Muhammad Taqil Majlisi. He writes, he says, even I accept that saying the third shahada in azan is a bid'ah. You are not supposed to say it. It is wrong. But uh, because it has become so well established now, even I say it out of what he calls, what, what we may call inverse taqiyya, out of fear of the public. Because if I don't say it, the people are so used to listening to the third shahada in azan and iqama. If someone doesn't say it, the people will be like, oh, he's, you know, Wahhabi, he's this, he's that. Uh, so, well, in the Safavid period, they wouldn't have used the term Wahhabi because the Wahhabis had still not emerged. But yeah, they would say that, you know, he's, he's against the Ahlul Bayt or something like that. So that's why he says, out of fear of the public, I say many, many things that I don't really believe in.
Wow, thank you so much for that context, Said. So um, we'll come to the question answers now. The first question comes from Taha Vali. He's saying, Salams, since we're in the month of Rajab, please enlighten us on the authenticity of, of Amaz of Laylatul Raghaib and Supro Nadar of Tunda of 6th Imam Alayhi lay salam on 22nd Rajab. Shukran. Um, so what, what, what's exactly his question about? So he's just asking um, you to enlighten him on the authenticity of the Amals and the Supra Nadar. I guess if there is any authenticity to it. Oh, okay. So yeah, so Laylatul Raghaib is a very, it's I think it's trending these days. A lot of people are confused as to what to do about this, right? The the amal for the special night in Rajab, right? Is the, is that what he's asking about? Yes. Yeah. The the one that just happened a few nights ago. I think it's oh, okay. the first Thursday of Rajab. Or right. Right. Like that. So so basically, <clears throat> yeah. As far as if you go by strict Rijali methodology, obviously. This is not uh, an authentic narration, but here's the thing. The concept that a lot of the a'mal that people do, uh, salawat that they recite, du'as that they recite, you know, different kinds of a'mal and acts of ritual worship, which they do, if you look at it from Rijali, uh, Rijali point of view, it is not authentic. But it comes under the umum of the Quran. So for example, if I say that on a certain night or certain day of the month, I'm going to pray 10 raka salah, sunnah. Okay. The Wahhabis and Salafis, they are very strict on this. And this is where we have major disagreements with them. They would say, no, you can't do this. You cannot take a specific day, which unless you have proof that the Prophet did this, you cannot... Uh, introduce any new practice in Islam. But the correct stance is that, look, there are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you general commands for. So, Ya ayyuhun nasu budu rabbakum. You who believe, worship your Lord. Okay? Irka'u wasu, perform ruku, perform sujood. These are things Allah has given you general commands for. So if I choose and pick a certain day of month, and I say, I'm going to do some extra worship on this day or this night. There is no haraj. Provided the worship I'm doing does not, uh, is focused on Allah. And it is in line with the way the Prophet taught us to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so if on any day of, if someone is fasting during the month of Rajab, if someone is worshipping during the nights, if he's praying, you know, mustahab, nafil, sunnah, salah, this is something you should be doing every day. Okay. But obviously, because of the ne busy nature of our life, people cannot afford to do a lot of worship every day. So what these amal do is that they give you certain nights and certain days and tell you, you know what, at least try to, if you can't do every day, try to do this on this specific day and this specific night. So from that point of view, <clears throat> if the amal itself is not... Uh, it does not have hulu content in it. Like, how do you know it has hulu content? All those amal that are focused on imams, where the imam is the focus of your attention, where you're speaking to the imam, talking to the imam, supplicating the imam, worshipping the imam, that obviously cannot be entertained or tolerated in Islam. But all those amal which you do, like sunnah, salah, you pray, Quran, you recite, dua, you recite, if the content of the dua is Allah-centric, it is focused on Allah, like the authentic duas of the imams, then there is no harm and haraj in that, even if it is not established. So, for example, we do not have any riwayah that you should pray two rakah shukr salah on Saturday. But suppose I make up my mind, I say, you know what, every Saturday I'm free or Sunday I'm free. I'm going to pray two rakah shukr salah. Even if this is not proven to be from the imam or, or the prophet, the command to offer shukr to Allah is proven from the Quran. Allah says, washkuru la. So many times in the Quran, he says, offer thanks to me. So if in compliance with this command, I pick a certain day or time in the month and I say, I'm going to offer thanks to Allah during, during this time. No Muslim and no one has the right to come and stop me and say, well, 
This particular day, the pro is not established. You cannot prove with absolute certainty that the Prophet also offered shukr salah on this day. Therefore, you should also not offer shukr salah. No, this is a general command. And that is why Allah has asked you to offer shukr. And that's why if you were to offer shukr 24 hours, it would still be little. So what to say about, you know, if you're offering it at a certain time or certain uh, period, there is no haraj and there is no ishkal in that. So fasting, salah, sadaqa, you know, reciting Quran, reciting good du'as that are all about Allah, that have zikr of Allah. These are things you should be doing not just on Laylatul Raga'ib, but you should be doing on every night. Okay. But you can't do them on every night. So that's why these amal were designed. Whether they were designed by imams, it's not proven that they were designed by imams. No problem. Even if a scholar designed them, even if you and I designed something like this, there's no haraj. Unless you can show that, no, 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 there is something here in this amal that is going against the teaching of the Quran, that is going against what the Prophet and Ahl Bayt taught us, then it has to be abandoned. But otherwise, it comes under the umum, the general commands of the Quran, and the general commands of the Quran, you can fulfill them whenever you like. And as far as sawab is concerned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever you hope from him, he will, inshallah, give it to you. Inshallah. And... Uh... And he also mentioned that uh, the Sufro, Nadr, or Kunda of 6th Imam alayhi salam on 22nd yeah. Rajab. Right. So that is obviously not established or proven. Uh, that is also not proven. Now, it depends what you do on this day. If you just gather on this day and maybe, let's say, have a lecture, <clears throat> talk about the life of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, or share teachings of Ahlul Bayt, and feed the poor people, something along those lines, then again, this is something you can do any day, okay? So there would be no harm if you do it on the 22nd of Rajab. But then there are some people who believe that, the whole belief that Imam al-Sadiq did this to celebrate the death of a certain tyrant and this, this, none of this is established. So if you do it with that niyyah and that intention, then you're obviously doing something for which there is no basis and none of the, even the maraja have, <laughs> would not support it. Lovely to say it, thank you. Um, the next question comes from uh, Major Bean Alarakia. She is saying, so was the notion of Qums also strengthened during the Safavid period? So actually in the Safavid period, <clears throat> Qums was not uh, promoted as much. In fact, the idea that was promoted uh, in the past uh, with regard to Qums was that it should be, so there are many narrations. When you go into the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, there are many narrations which have been attributed to them. One set of narration says that the Imams have forgiven Khumus from their Shia, for their Shia. No Shia has to pay Khumus until the Day of Judgment. You have several narrations in the Shia books that claim this. Then you have another set of narrations that, or rather opinions of scholars who said that Khumus should be buried. It should be buried in the ground because it's the mal of the Imam. When the 12th Imam will come, he's gonna distribute it. And then when you go further back into the classical period, like the time of Imam Sadiq salam, you have narrations which have been recorded by Sheikh al-Saduq, for example, in Man La Yahburuhu al faqi is one of the four books, uh, with, a, with an authentic chain from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam that he said, لَيْسَ الْخُمُسُ إِلَّا فِي الْغَنَائِمِ خَاصَةً That Allah has made khumus wajib only on spoils of war and nothing else. So that is one view you encounter in the classical sources. But in terms of strengthening the notion of khumus, this is something that has become very popular in the modern period. The way Khumus is being discharged, is being levied today, you will struggle to find precedence for this if you go far back. Even in the Safavid period, it was not being charged the way it is being charged today. This is a more modern and recent innovation from the time of the Risala Amaliyah, starting with Atullah Sayyid Muhammad Kazim Tabataba Il Yazdi, and then the establishment of the Marja'iyah, the beginning of Ijtihad and Taqlid, and all these things becoming very popular. So this is a much more modern thing. It's, it does not date back to the Safawid period. And inshallah, this is a deep, detailed discussion that we can have some other time, inshallah. Inshallah. On, on, on the roots of this. Inshallah. Thank you, Sayyid. The next question comes from Zara Rahintullah. She's asking, you mentioned that during the Safawid period, several new things came in, such as adding a third Shahada in the Avan. What other things did they implement? Does this mean we should not be engaging in such practices? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, 
So during the Safavid period, they added a lot. Basically, they disfigured, they changed the whole face of Shiism. And that's why this is something lay people do not know. But among the scholars, it's a well-established fact. Uh, Dr. Ali Shariati, read his book, uh, Black Shiism versus Red Shiism. So when he, when he talks about Black Shiism, he's referring to the, the Safavid Shiism. All these mourning rituals, ghadir, mubahala, public cursing of the icons of the ummah. All of these things are popularized. Wearing of black uh, during Muharram and Safar. And then, the, you know, the, the, the commemoration, you know, from one day of Ashura, that was a day of commemoration in the classical period, extending it to 10 days and then increasing it to one month and then two months and then two months and 10 days. And... All of these things, yeah, you find them in the Safawid, post-Safawid period. And I mentioned last time, I recommend this encyclopedia, Shiism in three volumes by Paul and Colin Turner. You have articles by great academics, some of them even Shia academics, uh, who have written extensively about the evolutions and, and the changes and developments that have taken place. Uh, inshallah, we will address some of those. The third Shahada can be a separate lecture on its own. And as far as the question, does this mean we should not be engaging in such practices? Uh, this is up to you to decide. <clears throat> when you call yourself a Shia, are you a follower of Alama Majlisi and the Safavid scholars? Are they your role models? Or do you want to follow the Imams of Ahlul Bayt? In many cases, the Safavids went completely against what the Ahlul Bayt and what the companions of the Ahlul Bayt and what the later classical Shia scholars taught. So you have a choice. You want to follow the original Islam? or you want to follow later editions. That is your choice. No one can force you. But if you want najat and salvation in the hereafter, and if you want to arrive on the day of judgment in a state where you can actually face Allah and face his messenger and face these imams of guidance and not have to you know, suffer the humiliation and embarrassment of being told that the whole deen that you are following was a fabrication of ghulat and enemies of Ahlul Bayt. If you want to avoid all of that, then you better explore. Firstly, the Quran, which is the syllabus. The Quran is like this beautiful photograph that Allah has taken of Islam as it was during the time of the Prophet. So everything you see in the syllabus, which has been mentioned clearly in the syllabus, you know that is true, authentic Islam. And everything that you see elsewhere, whether it's in the narrations, which are attributed to the Ahlul Bayt, whether it's being recited from the mimbar, whether it's being claimed by people left, right, and center, it doesn't have any trace in the Quran that is the first indication that it is a later edition. So <clears throat> that is why I would say that, yeah, if you are serious about salvation and on the day of judgment and not being embarrassed on the day of judgment, then you should abandon all practices which you find and which you discover are later editions because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken no guarantee for later editions. In fact, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt warned against these later editions and they cursed and disassociated themselves from people who who supported these kinds of gulu based beliefs and practices. So I would say, yes, we should abandon uh, these uh, practices and beliefs and we should reform ourselves and make ourselves, bring ourselves in line with what the original sources tell us about what the correct Islam is. Salaam sorry, I was I who asked the question. I, I was just wondering if, if you think that um, we should abandon those things that were we have found to be later editions that would include Things like uh, like Azadari, well into you know uh, two two and a half months, right? Or wearing of black, for example. You mentioned that that was also a later edition. Um, I just I'm I'm wondering where the line is and where I can draw it because I'm not a person that has so much time that I can oh, oh and I'm not so educated that I can I speak Arabic. I'm able to go into the the deep text that you are, for example. So how would I as a lay person be able to engage in, in this research and come to these conclusions? Right. So look, there's, there are different kinds of additions that have been made into Shiism. Some of them are deadly, cancerous. Some of them are somewhere in the middle. Some of them are very light, <clears throat> mubah kind of additions. Okay. So <clears throat> for example, uh, celebrating the birthdays and or commemorating the death anniversaries of holy personalities. Um, <clears throat> this is a, this was not a prevalent during the times of the Imams. Uh, the Imams never knew of this uh, concept. Uh, but 
if someone is uh, saying, okay, today is the day that the narration say the Imam is born. Today we're going to sit and we're talk going to talk about the life of the Imam. And we're going to try and revive his teachings and talk about what he really stood for. There's no harm in that. This is mubah. Okay. You can't promote this as an authentic sunnah, but you can't also dismiss it as a dangerous and anti-Islamic, anti-Quranic bid'ah. There is no verse in the Quran that forbids you from mentioning inspiring personalities from the past. In fact, you have support for that from the Quran. So no problem with that. Uh, if someone wants to wear black, uh, even on a khushali, you cannot stop them from that. That is their choice. In some cultures, the color black is considered to be a happy color. Okay. This is a cultural thing. So again, there are certain additions that have been made, which are mubah, certain additions, which are mustahab, maybe certain additions, which are haram. I think we should worry about the haram ones. Anything that has been added. So the Safawids added a lot of stuff that is haram into Shiism that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would have frowned at, that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would have been against. And most of that stuff is stuff that is against the Quran. So a lot of this, all these supernatural powers which are attributed to the, to the Imams or supernatural miracles and all of this kind of stuff or the belief that they are running the universe with Allah's permission. These are what constitute shirk and ghulu in the language of our Imams and also in the language of the Quran. So yeah, these are deadly beliefs. These must be abandoned at all costs. And we need to warn our near and dear persons. And you don't need to have, you said you're not uh, well-versed. You don't need to be well-versed. If you read the Quran seriously and sincerely in very plain and crystal clear language, Allah makes these things clear. You tell me which part of this verse of Surah Al-Ahqaf, Surah number 46, verse number five, which part of this verse is not clear? And which part of this verse needs an ijazah of ijtihad in ilmul usul to understand? When Allah says, وَمَنْ أَضَلُّ مِمَّنْ يَدْعُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَنْ لَا يَسْتَجِبُ لَهُ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Who can be more misguided than a person who invokes and calls upon and supplicates to entities other than Allah who cannot respond to them until the Day of Judgment? وَهُمْ عَنْ دُعَائِهِمْ غَافِلُونَ And those entities that you are making dua to they are ghafil, they are unaware that you are making dua to them. And on the day of judgment, when the people will be resurrected, these entities whom you are making dua to, they will be your biggest enemies, Allah says in verse 6. They will be your biggest enemies. And they will reject your ibadah. So clearly what the practice that's going on in our communities today where people are doing dua to imams, with the belief that Allah has empowered them to respond to our prayers and supplications, how do you reconcile this with what Allah is telling you in the Quran? And He's saying, no, ni, call upon me. Dua is for me. Dua is worship, as Imam al-Baqir tells us. So when the Quran and Ahlul Bayt are telling you that dua is worship, and the only entity that you are allowed to supplicate to beyond the curtain of ghayb is Allah, and Allah alone, but then you see that under the influence of the Safawids, for example, for the first time, dua tawassul, no one had heard of it before uh, the Safawid period. Al-Allam al-Majlisi in volume 99 of Bihar al-Anwar, he writes that I found this dua in one of the books. He doesn't even mention the name of the book. He doesn't even give a sanad from which imam he's getting it from. He said, it's just one of the books. I, one of the books, Baba the Ghulat, they wrote volumes after volumes of fabricated books. So he's taking one of those books. He's saying, well, dua tawassul is mentioned here. So I'm mentioning it in Bihar. Inshallah, we can recite it. It has the names of our imams and we can all recite it. And today people are reciting it on, on every Tuesday. But then the question is, this dua contradicts, as Ayatollah Fadlullah, the great reformist scholar says, you study the content of this dua. It is going against the teaching of the Quran and the teaching of, of Ahlul Bayt. And it's not a minor issue whereby you can say, okay, no, this is a major issue. So all those changes which are major, if we are interested in our salvation on the Day of Judgment, we should abandon all those major changes that people have made. For minor changes or mubah changes, that's up to you. So it's your taste. Ultimately, I think there in minor issues, we need education. We need to educate. Sometimes in our communities, if someone wears white in Muharram, for example, people will frown at that person. People will think this person doesn't love Abdullah al Hussein. So they need to be educated and told that, look, this is a cultural thing. It was introduced by the Safawids. It's not uh, an authentic practice of the Imam so that you should be able to condemn people who are not doing it. You know, where the Imams, you know, 
I have not said something, let people have freedom, let people do whatever they want. Okay, don't judge people on stuff that you don't have any evidence for. So that's all we are proposing over here. Excellent, Sayyid, thank you. Um, the next question is from Muhammad Ali. He says, Hulu replaced the mustahab with fard. Instead of labaik, Allahumma labaik, they say labaik ya Jafar. But we do not say labaik ya Hussein instead of labaik Allahumma in Hajj rituals. So isn't it allowed? Hmm. So this is where our brother is mistaken. The very year that I went to Hajj, there was an incident, a very unfortunate, heart rending incident. <clears throat> but both aspects of it were really <clears throat> equally sad and tragic, I would say. There was a report, there was a news of, of this Shia person, I think he was from Iraq. He was, in, when all the hujjaj were going to throw the stones, Ramiul Jamarat, right? He, instead of saying, Labaik Allahumma, <clears throat> marched towards that place saying, Labaik Ya Hussein. So even in Hajj, so they say one of the, the Saudi police officers over there, he assaulted this person and they say he threw him over a bridge, which obviously is, a, a, is an unconscionable act. No matter how deviant a person is, you're not allowed to take their life, okay? But what is equally regrettable and unfortunate is the fact that this person was doing something which Imam al Hussein, which Imam Ja'far, who is the grandson of Imam al Hussein, السلام, when he heard someone doing this about him, or when he was told that there are people doing this about you, he fell into sujood. And he was so distressed that Musadif says, I regretted telling Imam al Sadiq that, this, that there was a group of people who were doing this. Because the hal of Imam Ja'far, the way the color of his face changed, the way he started to tremble and, and shiver and shudder. He says, I wish I had not related this episode to him. So the, it is tragic that this person was killed. But it is also tragic that this person was told or that he was taught or the way Shiism was presented to this person that he started thinking that if I say labbaik ya Hussein instead of saying labbaik Allahumma labbaik that this would be something that Imam al-Hussein would be pleased with. Or that Imam Ja'far Sadiq would be pleased with. The, the reality is Imam al Hussein and Imam Ja'far Sadiq both would reject this. And they themselves in their hajj, they would say labbaik Allahumma labbaik. And they were never heard saying labbaik to anyone other than Allah. So if you are going to say labbaik ya Hussein, you need to investigate. Did the Imams of Ahlul Bayt who came after Imam al Hussein, did they raise this slogan? If you can show us authentic narrations where the Imams of Ahlul Bayt raised this slogan or their chosen trustworthy companions whom the imams endorsed and approved if they raised a slogan like this no problem but if you're doing this from your own pocket then you need to think about the consequences because labbaik as far as why did imam al-sadiq fall into such that because he said look this is reserved for allah there are certain things in the deen which are reserved exclusively for allah and the ghulat their whole project was that everything that is exclusively reserved for Allah, we want to transfer it where? To the Ahlul Bayt. Why? Because we want to make the Ahlul Bayt into our new God. We want to worship the Ahlul Bayt. We don't want to worship Allah. That was the stance of the Ghulat. So everything that's unique to Allah, responding to prayers and supplications, he said, give it to the Imams. Make Allah give it, no problem, but give it to the Imams. Because we don't want to pray to Allah, we want to pray to the Imams. Ilmul Ghaib. It's exclusive to Allah. Allah says in the Quran, لا يعلم من في السماوات والأرض الغيب إلا الله. No one in the heavens and the earth knows the ghayb except Allah. The Ghulat said, okay, if this is exclusive to Allah, the Ahlul Bayt should also be given this. Everything that's unique and exclusive to Allah, the Ghulat took it, gave it to the Ahlul Bayt. They wanted to replace Allah with the Ahlul Bayt. And that's why they made the Ahlul Bayt the focus of their devotion. And they invented narrations and ziyarat that teach you to do the same thing. And this is what we must avoid. This is what we need to save ourselves from. Thank you, Sayyid. H. Fazl is asking, could you please elaborate on the revolution of the obligation of Salatul Jum'ah at the Safavid period? Oh, okay. So during the Safavid period, yeah, al alam al-Majlisi, for example, he says that Salatul Jum'ah is wajib aini. So because in the Safawid period, they wanted to, they wanted the Shias to coalesce. 
and they wanted to assert their identity. So he declared Salatul Jum'ah to be wajib aini, but with particular peculiar Shi'i elements. So for example, in the khutbah of Jum'ah, the reading of the names of the 12 Imams, the 12 Imams, this was not there in the time of the Prophet or the Imams of Ahlul Bayt or even later on. But during the Safawid period and in the later period, you find that they start adding these kinds of things to make the Salatul Jum'ah different from the Salatul Jum'ah of the rest of the people. So inshallah, that is something that we can discuss more uh, because there is a lot of material to cover in terms of exactly what the Safawids did at the ritualistic level, ritually speaking, what they did, what new things they introduced. Inshallah, we can discuss that in a, in a separate lecture. Inshallah. Thank you. Murtaza Shokat Ali saying, Takiyah is haram on imams if they were divinely appointed. So he said, were the imams divinely appointed, that would make takiyah not obligatory on them. He, then he said, sorry, it should read that takiyah is haram on imams if they were divinely appointed. Oh, okay, so with regard to divine appointment, again, you see a world war going on on this issue of divine appointment within the Shia community itself from the time of the imams. So if you go back to the earliest and most authoritative book of Ilmur Rijal we have present today, Rijal al-Kashi, he mentions a debate that took place during the time of Imam al-Sadiq between two people, two narrators. One of them, Abdullah bin Abi Ya'fur, who is one of the most distinguished and trustworthy companions of Imam al-Sadiq according to the classical Shia. When they write about him, they say, Thiqatun Thiqa, <laughs> double Thiqa, like he's super trustworthy. Abdullah bin Abi Ya'fur. And there is this another narrator who also claims to narrate a hadith from imams. His name is Al-Mu'alla ibn Khunais. Al-Mu'alla ibn Khunais has been dismissed and discredited by the tradition, by the classical scholars of Shia al murrijal as a notorious ghali. In fact, one of the ringleaders of the movement of Ghulub. So there is a, a debate between a follower and a companion of Imam Sadiq and this ghali chief. And the topic of the debate is whether the imams are divinely appointed or, or not. Abdullah bin Abi Ya'fur says, no, they're not divinely appointed. They are ulama at qiyya abrar. They are scholars who are pious. They are people of taqwa. They are, but they are scholars. Who, and the reason why we follow them is not because God has appointed them, but rather because they are the most learned and well-versed in the Quran and in the sunnah and in the uh, teachings of the prophet. So that's why we follow them to the exclusion of all others. al Mu'alla ibn Khunais says, no, we also follow the Imams, but we follow them because they, we believe that they are divinely appointed. When the case is taken to Imam al-Sadiq, according to this particular narration, Imam al-Sadiq rules in favor of Abdullah bin Abi Ya'qur. And he dismisses and rejects and repudiates the claim of al Mu'alla ibn Khunais and al Mu'alla ibn Khunais himself was someone who has later on discredited by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and also by other Ghulat. So in the classical period, you don't have the concept of divine appointment as you have today. In fact, uh, scholars like uh, Sayyid al-Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr in his advanced level uh, discussions in his Hawza, uh, and in the lectures that have been recorded, his students mentioned that even he was of the same belief that al imama the way it is believed today, is not part of the usul al-din. It's not among the daruriyat al-madhab. It's not a non-negotiable, essential belief of Shiaism. This was the view of Sayyid al-Shaheed, Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr. So now, if moving on, his question is that if imams are not divinely appointed, then that means they're regular people. Then why can they not do taqiyya? The answer is that from the classical point of view, they are not, even if they are not divinely appointed, they are still scholars. They're people of knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he does not allow people of knowledge to hide knowledge. Repeatedly Allah says, he scolds the scholars of Ahlul Kitab. He says, Lima taktumun al haqq Why are you concealing the truth? Lima talbisun al haqqa bil batili wa taktumun al haqqa wa antum ta'alamun. Why are you covering up the truth <clears throat> when you know that it is the truth? So Allah does not allow people who have knowledge of something and who are in a position of leadership and who are role models to do taqiyya. Because if they start lying, 
then people are following these kinds of people. So then people will get misled and there will be no one to correct them. So that's why the classical scholars, if you go by their position, then it would appear that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would not do taqiyya because they themselves were conscious of the fact that a lot of people are looking up to us for guidance. A lot of people are following us. They are recognizing our spiritual authority and spiritual leadership by virtue of how much we know the Quran and we know the Sunnah. So if we start lying to the people and start telling them fatawi, giving them fatawi, which are contradictory to the truth, then we are basically misguiding the ummah. So that's why the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, because they recognized the fact that people are t seeking guidance from them, that is why they never lied to them. But the Ghulat, they promoted this idea big time that no, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are not to be trusted. Whenever they narrate a narration which agrees with what the mainstream Muslims are doing, you should reject that narration and instead accept what we narrate and attribute to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And usually what the Ghulat attribute to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt is the opposite of what the rest of the Ummah is doing. <clears throat> and so the Ghulat wanted to isolate the Shia from the rest of the Ummah by making them follow stuff that was the opposite of what the rest of the Ummah was doing under the pretext that that is what the Imams preached. Thank you, Sayyid. The next question comes from Taha Dali. He's saying, Usuluddin, Adala, and Imama. Was it introduced in the Safavid area? Please clarify. Shukri. So in terms of making it part of the Usuluddin, yeah, this was definitely under the, the influence of Gulu. If you look, if you go back to the early classical narrations where the Imams talk about uh, the Islam and the Deen, they don't mention such beliefs. But this is something, inshallah, we'll dis discuss more in more detail, where did this concept of wilaya and all these things come from? They're obviously, they're not found in the earliest sources, they're not found in the Quran, and also in the authentic ahadith. They are found in classical collections uh, in certain narrations, but when you examine the chains, you see the notorious wulats that the classical scho scholars are warning us about. So clearly this is a, this was something that did exist during the time of the Imams, but it was only believed in by fringe groups. Later on, these fringe group beliefs were mainstreamed and made uh, a standard doctrine in the Safavid period. How that was done is inshallah something we can discuss in more detail in the future. Inshallah, Sayyid. Um, since we won't be having a session next week, is it okay if we take a couple more questions? Is that yeah, okay sure. with you? All right, thank you. Yeah. The next question comes from uh, Sister Sabra Devji. She's saying, Salam, what about the amals of Laylatul Qadr? where we mention the names of the 14 Ma'asumin with the Quran on our heads. Is that Gulu? Um, so just mentioning the names of the 14 Ma'asumin is not Gulu, but the practice of doing this in Laylatul Qadr is something that has no basis in the original teachings of the Imams. So to do this thinking that I'm doing something that the Imams would be happy with or that the Imams did themselves, that would be wrong. So the claim that the Imams asked you to take their names on Laylatul Qadr, that is unfounded. But if you take their names or you make mention of them on Layal Qadr, uh, yes, if you do it in a way which diverts your focus from Allah, see Layal Al Qadr are what the Imams of Ahlul Bayt do in Layal Al Qadr. They would do zikr of Allah, they would recite Quran, they would stand up Allah, his Asma'ul Husna, praying to him, supplicating to him. Their Layal Al Qadr was a very Allah centric night. The Ghula and the Safawids, they, didn't, they were allergic to anything that is only about Allah. They wanted to bring the Imams in everything. So even in those rituals which have come down to the Imams, which has Allah in it, they would add the names of the Imams to it. They wanted the names of the Imams to come in everything. Even in the Quran, in places where you cannot imagine that the name of the Imam or the Imam would be implied, the Ghulat said, no, we believe this is about. So in, in Tafsir Ali bin Ibrahim al-Qummi, which is a classical Tafsir, is full of Ghulat narrators. Okay. So Ali bin Ibrahim was, again, his Tafsir itself was corrupted by the Ghulat later on. And that's why I say this Sistani does not regard its chains as being uh, fully authentic. But in any case, in Tafsir Ali bin Ibrahim al-Qummi, you find that in the Tafsir of the verse of verse 23 of Surah Al-Baqarah, in Allah la yastahi an yadriba mathalam ma ba'udatan fama fawqaha, Allah does not shy away from giving the example of a mosquito 
the ghulat came and said uh, al ba'uda ali ibn abi talib the, the meaning of mosquito here is ali ibn abi talib so you have mosquito and ali ibn abi, what, what what relationship the ghulat were like we don't care relationship everywhere you can insert ali you insert it you make sense doesn't make sense you just insert it so this is what the ghulat were all about they wanted to replace allah and insert the imam into everything so yes in your a'mal Wherever you see the names of the imams, you know, being mentioned, just compare it with classical texts. In Sahifa Sajjadiyya, which is an, a manual of Imam Zain al-Abideen, which even the traditional scholars, they rely on so much. You look at Sahifa Sajjadiyya, you see no, you don't even see the name of Imam al-Husayn in the dua in which Imam Zain al-Abideen makes for his parents. He doesn't mention Imam Hussein al-Islam by name. So from this, you get the, the sense that the amal and the worship and the ibadat of imams were fully focused on Allah. And there was, yes, there's a lot of salat and salam and sending blessings and peace on Muhammad and al-Muhammad. Yes, that is authentic. That is commanded by Allah in the Quran. But then mentioning each and every single one of them by name and devoting yourself to them, talking to them, making them the focus of your devotion instead of Allah, that there is no evidence for in the sources. Thank you, Sayyid. Um, and we have launched a poll. If uh, everybody could uh, please give their honest remarks, that would be appreciated. Um, the next question comes from uh, Hussein Somchi. He's saying, how do today's merger justify knowing the truth and not sharing it with their followers? Does it not make <clears throat> them a kafir, someone who knows the truth and does not act on it? Oh, takfir. No, so I told you, today the grand scholars of today are divided into different groups. Some of them know about the, what is going wrong and they speak out about, uh, against it. Now, if their voices are not reaching you, then maybe you need to tune in to you know, the bandwidth and frequency at, at which they're speaking. If you read their writings in their advanced level books, they're talking about all of these things. Ayatollah Saleh Najaf Abadi, for example, is a very prominent reformist scholar. He has written extensively about Ghulu and all of these things that have happened. Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussain Fadlullah, Ayatollah Sayyid Kamal Al Haydari, Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Hubbullah. These are all high level Mujtahideen Maraji who have spoken out against these things and who have highlighted these things. So that's one group. The other group of Maraja, yes, there are some like Ayatollah Sayyid Shahabuddin Marashi Najafi. He, he has been influenced by, he has grown up reading all that Safawid literature. So he's, he has started believing in the, in the myths that the Safawids promoted. So now these scholars, Bichara, you can't do anything about them. They have fallen for the propaganda. They have been taken for a ride. The only thing that we can do is pray for them and, you know, hope the best for them. The other group of uh, yeah, scholars are those, yes, who know the, the truth. But like Sayyid al-Burjurdi is saying, he's saying, look, I'm prepared to tell the truth, but you, the public, are not willing to listen to it. So this is the problem. The public also needs to elevate its, open up its mind. And, you know, we need to, our public needs to, you know, it's very easy to condemn the Wahhabis for intolerance. But when reformist perspectives are shared within our own communities, you see the Wahhabi side of the Shias. They become so intolerant. They say, no, this is deviation. And this is blasphemy. And this is this. Baba, you are saying this is blasphemy. But the scholars of the past believe that what you are saying is blasphemy. So, so then, okay, if, if, it's, if it's neck and neck, if it's one scholar against one scholar, then let's investigate. Let's explore. No one can, ultimately, the aim of this series is not to tell you what to believe in. In Aqidah, as we said, right from the beginning, there is no taqlid. All we have to do is when we see that the classical scholars <clears throat> and the traditional modern day scholars are fighting a world war and the classical scholars are saying, look, we have the teachings of the imams. We are closer to the time of the imams. We know more about what the imams believed in than you know. And we lived before the Safavid period. So all the changes and the stuff that you added, we were free from that. So when the Islam that we are offering you is much cleaner compared to what later scholars are offering you. So ultimately, you listen to everyone, okay? What we need in our communities is to open up our minds, to become more open-minded, to become more tolerant of reformist voices. Because look, there is no point suppressing these voices. This is evidence, it will come out. If you don't dig it out, your enemies and your opponents will dig it out and they will humiliate you. 
with all this evidence. So it's better you clean your own house and you put it in order before other people come and do that for you. Definitely, Sayyid. Thank you. The next question is from Sabra Devji. We have been told that Bibi Zainab began the practice of the Azadari and the fourth Imam did not stir. So Azadari is from earlier times or Safavid times? No, no, no. So what Bibi Zainab started was different from what is being done today. So it's like <clears throat> Sayyidah Zainab Salamullahi Alayha, she stood up for Imam Al-Husayn Alayhi Salam. She spoke uh, in the court of Yazid. She defended the mission of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, but she never approved of the things that are being done today. So for example, when Sayyid Shahabuddin al-Marashin Najafi says that at the time of Salah, if the Mu'adhin is trying to tell the people to keep quiet and go so that he can give the Adhan, a lot of people think that this is also Azadari, that you know you suppress the Adhan and let the people continue to do Azadari. So which Azadari okay, are you talking about? If you are talking about having grief in your heart for Aba Abdullah al-Husayn, then that is an authentic... Uh, thing from uh, the imams every you cannot show me a single imam after Aba Abdullah al Hussein who was not sad at the fact that Aba Abdullah al Hussein was martyred in the manner in which he was martyred so that husn is natural but then how you express it if one way of expressing that husn for example is to say that I am going to commit myself to reviving the legacy of Aba Abdullah al Hussein just as he stood up against the Yazid of his time I'm going to campaign against injustice this is one Azadari. The other Azadari is to say, I'm so angry that Imam al Hussein was killed, I will not pray Salah. Instead, I will do Matam and I will recite Noha when the time was. Now, this kind of Azad, you can't then attribute and say, well, Sayyidah Zainab started Azadari, so why are you asking people to stop Azadari? She did not invent this Azadari and she did not introduce this Azadari. Her concept was completely different. To, unfortunately, over the centuries, people have added a lot of un Islamic stuff. That's what the reformist scholars are saying needs to go out, but not the whole thing. Thank you, Sayyid. Um, we just have two more questions and then inshallah we, we will end the session. Mm -hmm. uh, Nasir Jafar is asking, sending salams to Ahlul Bayt. Does this relate to 12 Imams? As we understand, are there sources to confirm the 12 Imams? So sending salam and salat on the Prophet and his al, it is an established practice in the entire Ummah. You cannot pin this on the Ghulat because the first sign of a Ghali invention is that it is not shared. First of all, it contradicts the Quran, it goes against established Sunnah. And one way of catching a Ghali narration is to see that the rest of the Ummah, if something is, is being claimed and it's not to be found anywhere except in the uh, claims of the or the literature of the Ghulat, then you know it's their invention because if it was preached by the Prophet, it would, it would have reached the other Muslims as well. So in any case, the, the important thing is sending salat and salam on the prophet and his companions and his Ahlul Bayt and his, this is okay. Praying for a person, <clears throat> praying for a person, even if he has left this world is okay. It's established from the Quran, no problem. It is praying to a person who has left this world that the Quran says you can't do because that is invoking an entity across the curtain of life, something you cannot do for anyone except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as sources which can from the 12 Imams, I don't understand the question. What, like the identity of the 12 Imams? Yeah, so my question is, during the time of the Prophet, when they were, to, when they were discussing about Ahlul Bayt sending salams, mm -hmm. was the, was the, did that mean, did that mean that uh, uh, Imam Ali, Bibi Fatima, Imam Hassan Hussein, or at that time, it meant 12 imams, as we understand. Did the concept of 12 imams, uh, is it authentic? How authentic is it? All right. So actually, it, it, the concept of the 12, it has been attributed to the Prophet in the narrations. But if you examine very, very closely, you will see that during the time of the Prophet, uh, there was the, the concept was of the Ahlul Bayt, the Panjatan, as they are known today, the, the five. They are the ones whom the Prophet recognized as his Ahlul Bayt. And then later on, you have narrations which try to say that the Prophet then predicted that other Imams would also come. So the birth of Imam al-Baqir is predicted. Uh, the birth of Imam Ali ibn al Hussein they say, is predicted. But you don't see the Prophet mentioning Imams beyond the fifth Imam. 
in the narrations. But yes, in some of the uh, the Ghali narrations, yeah, you have all the Imams mentioned by names, but they basically backdate those narrations and they attribute them to the Prophet as part of their reverse engineering of, of all these concepts and backdating them to the time of the Prophet. Excellent. Thank you, Sayyid. And our last question comes from uh, Brother Mosin Haji. He says, quick question. We were always taught about how the highest levels of marjas are in touch with the living imams with regards to issuing fatwas. Can you shed some light into this? Right. So there is no evidence for this because uh, we have not seen any respected marja claiming that he is in touch with the imam or that a certain fatwa that he's giving is supported by the imam. In fact, if this was the case, there would be no difference of opinion among the maraja themselves. So for example, if there's a difference of opinion between uh, Sayyid Sistani and Sayyid Al-Khui on the issue of moon, moon sighting, at least one of them would have met the imam and he could have told the other one that, look, I've met the imam and the imam, uh, I'm in touch with the imam and the imam is confirming my theory and he's saying your theory is false. So, you know, get rid of your theory and let everyone follow my theory. But you don't see the maraja doing this. In instead, the maraja themselves, say the Sistani, if he was in touch with the imam, he would never tell you that, okay, you can follow uh, Sayyid al-Khui uh, or those people who are already in the taqlid of Sayyid al-Khui can continue to follow Sayyid al-Khui. He would not say that. He would say, I'm in touch with the Imam. The Imam has told me my theory is correct. Sayyid al-Khui was mistaken. But you don't see this. Uh, I mean, I cannot vouch for the lower level. Uh, among the lower level traditional clergy, you find a lot of claims about meeting the 12th Imam and this and that. But uh, high level scholars, I've never seen them claiming that, you know what, this I'm in touch with the Imam and this fatwa of mine has been endorsed by the Imam. That is not the case. They're, they're not in touch with the Imams. If they were, they would not have these disputes because all of these disputes would be solved by the Imam. The Imam would not allow for such division to, to exist. So there would be one uniform fiqh, there would be one fatwa, and all the maraja would be agreed on it. And even those maraji who would disagree, those maraje who are in contact with the imam would be able to convince them and tell them that, look, this is what the imam has told us. So this is what we are following and this is what you should also follow. But that is not the case and no maraje have claimed that. All maraje say, look, we are doing our research. We are trying our level best. We don't claim that we are masoom. Our fatwa can be mistaken. Inshallah, because it is based on research, mujzi'un wa mubri'un zimma. Inshallah, if you follow it, we hope that you will not fall into trouble. If Allah wills. Excellent. Thank you, Sayyid. We've come to the end of the session. Um, once again, thank you so much for your time and thank you all the participants for uh, asking uh, all the enlightening questions and Sayyid for the enlightening answers. We appreciate your time and effort that you put into this. Jazakallah khairan, um, uh, Brother Mudassir, for hosting us. I'm very grateful to Al Islah and to you as well for allowing for these discussions and for uh, facilitating and promoting healthy discussions on these, these critical and crucial issues. May Allah bless all of you. Barakallahu feekum. Definitely. And uh, we do not have a session next week, so we will keep in touch with all the members on uh, future events. And we shall discuss, we shall continue the discussion on the WhatsApp group. Thank you, everybody. Inshallah.